This is the Wolf Connection Podcast. Let's talk about some wolves. On this episode of the Wolf Connection Podcast, back with me is Leo Lecky, our Yellowstone wolf expert, and he's going to update us on some of the wild wolf packs in Yellowstone and one that's in California. Leo, welcome. He's joining us via Zoom. How are you doing down there? Doing all right, John. Thanks for having me. Glad to be back with you and talk about wild wolves in Yellowstone and North America. Yeah, this we you sent me some awesome info. I believe it was two weeks ago, and this is where I had to reconnect with you and talk about some of the wild wolves and some of the recovery efforts that are going on out there in the wild. I do want to start here in our home state of California where there is, there's a pack called the Lassen Pack, which you sent me some information from the Center for Biological Diversity. Give them a little shout out. So for the fourth straight year, they've had a successful breeding. And I believe their last, uh, their last pack was four pups again. So this is the first, correct me if I'm wrong, this is the first wild pack in the state of California in, a, in roughly 100 years. Is that correct? Actually, this is the second wolf pack. The first wolf pack was the Shasta pack, and they were in 2015. Um, This Lawson pack is the second pack, and the the Shasta pack uh, was first uh, confirmed in existence in 2015, uh, cited two adults and five pups, so a pack of seven, but not long after that, the pack mysteriously disappeared and they vanished on the scene as of 2016. So they were pretty short-lived. Uh, the Lawson pack in, um, in consider or in juxtaposition to that started in 2017 and has been in existence for four years now, which is pretty cool. So they're, they're basically California's established resident wolf pack. So what do you do? What's the first, when you were in Yellowstone, what, was the, what, were the, what were the initial steps that you all had to take when you saw that a pack was being formed or you saw that there were these reproduction rates that were successful for consecutive years? What were the steps that you guys in Yellowstone would take to start to look to collar, to track, to, to, to record and get the information you need to get? Yeah, so... The entity in charge, the scientific unit in charge of doing that is called the Yellowstone Wolf Project. I didn't work with them, but I was an observer and communicated with the staff of the Wolf Project very regularly um, about what they would basically do is they, today, they radio collar wolves two different time periods what's called the early winter study, which is in December, where they send out teams to observe the wolves from the ground. They do flyovers by plane over the air, and then they will also, it on set dates, set up a time where that flyover plane will call in the location of a wolf pack, and a helicopter team will come in to uh, radio collar that wolf. The other part of that is what's called the late winter study, and that's in March. When I first uh, arrived in Yellowstone in 2010, they had a team of five staff members, and that team did all the work. They're, they're in the helicopter. They're going out. They're actually, they were using tranquilizer darts back then, so they, the uh, – director of the Wolf Project, Doug Smith, would be leaning out the open door of a helicopter as the helicopter is trying to get as close to a wolf as possible and then uh, shoot that wolf with this tranquilizer dart. And then the helicopter would land and as quickly as possible, the team would go out to, uh, it's a pretty drawn out process. They have to figure out how to fit the radio collar on a wolf. And there are variable things that come into consideration when they're doing that. Uh, It would be the gender of the wolf, the age of the wolf, things like that, that go into determination of the, of the fitting of the collar 
and it's done in actually three different individuals do an assessment of the collar fitting so that they've got, you know, things covered as far as getting three different assessments and opinions of what's going on. And then while they're radio collaring, they'll take a blood sample, they'll check the teeth, which is used as a way to verify, or not verify, but kind of guesstimate the age of a wolf uh, if they don't know the date of birth, um, and then take other measurements like weight and things like that. So that's how we know what is the, the heaviest wolf on record in Yellowstone and things like that. Yeah, I, I've seen some some video of that uh, on certain programs i think in some national geographics they've they've shown some of those those radio collaring expeditions or missions whatever it is just to get and it's really just to get a baseline for these wolves so that you can track them obviously through the seasons and to follow them along as they grow and some of these these animals reproduce the pack gets larger so in your estimation as we, we we track back to the Lassen pack now that it's had this four year consistent reproduction period, is there going to be an established group that's going to go and try? Because I've seen, I, I saw the video cam footage that you sent me, the pictures that were taken on these trail cams. So clearly these these wolves are, are they're out, they're about, the pups are out. So what what, what are the next steps that's going to happen with the Lassen pack where they are in terms of a scientific perspective? Yeah, so they uh, follow under the actual guidance of California Division of Fish and Wildlife, CDFW, and they're the ones who provided the trail cam footage, who provided the initial sighting information, confirmation of the pups over the last four years uh, that has gone out to the media, and they're the ones who are in charge basically of what, let's say, um, so depredation is very low in California as far as depredation of cattle. There have been a couple instances, but that, that vast percentage is very low. They're also in charge of mitigating, working with ranchers and, and to kind of find ways that to allow wolves to coexist in, in alongside of these ranching communities the best way possible. And there are some organizations in the state that are working, like uh, the Working Circle Initiative, uh, workingcircle.org, I think is their URL, and they are doing specific work with ranchers to practice this peaceful coexistence in the state of California and help them along learning ranching techniques that allow them to live and live alongside uh, predators. Right. So, and that's, that's largely where a lot of these impacts happen for wild, wild wolf packs is that there's depredation. Again, if I'm, if I misspeak, please, you know, correct me here is when uh, uh, one of these cattle is taken and killed by the pack. And so therefore the, the, the rancher has, a case for, you know, losing, losing money or something like that, right? Is that sort of how it works? And then there goes into an aspect of how do we, how do we deter the, the pack from not coming after the cattle again? And that's where those groups come in, in terms of using non-lethal methods. Exactly. And, um, uh, CDFW, the Division of Wild uh, Fish and Wildlife in California has a team that actually goes out and does a very good job of assessing the cause of death when there might be an assumed depredation that has happened with uh, with livestock. And there are certain things that they look for that that enable them to be able to tell whether real, whether a wolf attacked that particular livestock or whether they came along and possibly fed on an already um, dead animal. Copy. Okay. So that's, yeah. So it's, it's so an they have specific yeah. and they do a very good job keeping the public informed. And yeah. So uh, on the positive end with this or, or let's shift our focus is that, so with this pack now reproducing for four years, what's really the, the significance in your, in your eyes 
as someone who's been at Yellowstone for over a decade and now you're here in California, what's the significance of having an actual pack back in the state of California? And their lo- I think their location is what, north, the northeast portion of the state, right? Is that, am I correct in that, in that assessment? Yeah, you're exactly right. Northeast portion of the state, northern kind of tip of the Sierra, uh, Sierra Nevada mountains up there in California. Um, they, um, one of the, there are a lot of benefits that we've discovered in Yellowstone to wolves, like an apex predator, like the wolf being in the ecosystem. And that is actually creating ecological balance within the ecosystem and environment in question. Um, wolves will, whenever possible, prey on the least healthy member of a herd or group of animals that it hunts within its area because those animals can do less damage to a wolf. What we found in Yellowstone is that the second most uh, most common way that a wolf dies in the park is from the animals it hunts. And you're talking about hunting animals that are quite a bit bigger. The main prey population, main prey species for the Lawson pack in Northern California is going to be deer. It's going to be mule deer. And, you know, some of those animals can be pretty big and they, they have hooves and antlers at times and they will definitely lash out and cause damage. So the wolves are hunting the less healthy animals and thereby what they're doing is strengthening and buoying the, the genetic base of that particular herd of animals within that environmental system. Um, There are some other benefits um, such as that we're discovering, uh, especially back in the Midwest with the Great Lakes population, uh, they're discovering that the wolves there are actually hunting uh, deer that have chronic wasting disease, CWD. Chronic wasting disease has not hit California yet California is kind of geographically isolated in such a way that it really hasn't encroached, but that doesn't mean there isn't a possibility that it could eventually make its way. We, for a long time, never even considered chronic wasting disease in Yellowstone, but now it's at the doorstep. It's at the Elk Refuge near Jackson, Wyoming, which is, you know, right in the heart of Grand Teton National Park, and just south of Yellowstone National Park. So it has been moving westward. Um, does it, it, the chances are pretty low for California, but you never know with these diseases. And so just go into, just give an explanation too about uh, chronic wasting disease and what happens to the deer itself and the deer population. I, I, I have been reading about and hearing about on other podcasts and other art and what reading on other articles, how, this is a this disease really ravages the population of really any deer population there. So what what does C, uh, CWD do, um, and how does it impact the deer population? It definitely uh, depreciates the vitality of the herd by this disease spreading through different members through breeding. It has also infected elk populations, and that's affecting elk populations heading westward too. So you're um, second largest member of the deer family, the elk, is also being affected. Um, the disease causes um, delirium, uh, uh, other physical manifestations that just basically chronic wasting, just exactly what the words imply. It's a wasting away of the animal in question that's suffering from this disease. And it's gradual and it's painful long lasting and thankfully we have wolves that can you know help to deal with that situation that's affecting our our wild herds in this country yeah we've been lucky in that way so lastly before we get on to yellowstone because we're, we're going to discuss a couple of packs that um have have had some growth and you want to touch on some of these as well so moving forward it, with the last impact, we're just, it's sort of in a wait and see mode to see, I guess, year by year, six months at a time to see how these pups develop, where their territory range goes. 
will they be, do you think they'll be moving in and out of state? They'll be, they'll have some residency in California and move into some of the neighboring states. What do you, where do you get a feel for where this pack is going to move and how large could it grow? Could it spawn into a couple of different packs? What's your feeling there? Yeah, that's a great question. It'll be interesting to see what happens. Um, There um, have been a number of wolves sighted in these northernmost counties of California. And uh, the hope is that we might get some other packs there. And some of those packs could begin from a dispersal of members of the Lawson pack. So the Lawson pack, one thing that's cool about them is you've got eight pups, but you also have six other uh, members of the family. You've got two older adults, the breeding male and female, and then you have uh, four, year, what, two, five, I'm trying to remember here, I think four yearlings, no, one two-year-old and three yearlings for a total of, you know, eight pups and then uh, what we'll say three adults and three yearlings for a total of 14 wolves. The cool thing about that is that is a multi gen kind of what we call a multi generational representation of a wolf family or pack, which is really nice. In a lot of these areas where wolves are trying to eke out an existence, you've got a breeding pair and pups, and that's all you get is that over and over again. In Yellowstone, we have successive generation, year after year after year, uh, members of litters that stay with the pack. So you've got, you know, representatives from litters from many years. And the cool thing about the Lawson pack is they're looking a lot, starting to look a lot like that yellow, those Yellowstone packs that we have and being, you know, having members from multiple litters staying with the pack. So it's pretty cool. And as far as, you know, dispersal goes, um, all of the wolves that have come into California have come from Oregon that we know of. All the known wolves started with uh, OR7 back in 2011, uh, who when he was two years old, he was born in 2009. Uh, his, his, a, he goes, his AKA is either Journey or Wander for the, the, the many miles that he's put along his travels starting in uh, Northeast Oregon when he was first collared. Um, but uh, he was the first wolf in about 87, uh, yeah, 80, exactly, 87 years um, to come back into California. So 1924 is the last known wolf that was killed in California, OR7. 87 years later in 2011 is the first confirmed wolf to re-enter the state. We've had a number of wolves enter the state after that. Of course, we had that Shasta pack that started, but now we've got this Lawson pack that they um, undoubtedly survived the hog fire that you heard of that was going on in Northern California in that area. Wolves are actually, you know, the good thing is when these wildfires usually happen, they're later in the season when the pups are a little bit bigger and more able to travel with the pack. And so the pack can usually do a pretty good job of avoiding the the pitfalls and dangers of wildfires. It's amazing how adaptive they are. And we talk about this a lot with you. And even when we're looking at our own pack here, just to realize how adaptive they are with the changing of the seasons, when it's 100 degrees up here and then it drops down and it snows. So we get a a wide range. and And the fact that these wolves are able to adapt to so many different situations on the fly really is is fairly amazing that they're such a unique species in that way and with with this with this packing here do you see there being some positive environmental aspects with th- this pack now sort of esta- I mean would you call it an established pack now that we've had this for this four consecutive year breeding succession and that you have a multi-generational pack, like you said? Yeah, exactly. Definitely would be, the Lawson pack would be considered a success story. And um, they occupy an area of the state that has an abundance of deer and other prey species that, that they will be able to affect in a very positive way. Um, by you know keeping the keeping the the numbers in balance and the behavior 
of the animals as well, affecting the behavior. The, the way I mentioned behavior is a lot of people, when wolves were first reintroduced into Yellowstone, yes, the elk numbers were changed initially, but more significantly, the behavior was changed which I think I spoke of in our, our last session, which was basically the elk moving once their, once their um, ancient predator had come back onto the scene, they moved from those low valleys where they were browsing down all of the vegetation and the brush into higher hill areas where they could be more watchful for the wolves around them. And that very same behavior change is going to take effect with the animals, uh, with the deer population in Northern California as well. That's going to, that's eventually, you know, when the wolves first arrive on the scene, there's a learning curve. But today we like to say that in Yellowstone, we have a leaner and meaner elk because they've existed side by side with wolves for 25 years. And now they're, they're a pretty tough animal to hunt in general. Yeah. I, as we move on to the Yellowstone pack, so we're, we're obviously going to keep, we're, Definitely come back anytime. Uh, we're going to keep our eyes on this last unpack and see how they how they go in the next couple of years. But you you sent over some great information, and for those of you out there that may not know, the success rate of a hunt for a wolf pack is very low. I think it's below one percent, or it's right around that, right, Leo? Where you're talking about an animal that roughly weighs, let's just say, 120 pounds, give or take, depending on male or female, that's hunting an animal that can be 10 times their size. Bison, elk can be anywhere as, you know, up to five, 600 pounds. So that the, the success rate on a hunt is so low. And like you said, now that these, these elk have gotten to be leaner and quicker, and the, as you can see, the gene pool has obviously gotten better over these last 25 years, right? Yeah, exactly. Definitely. So when we move on, so we're going to move into Yellowstone now. So we're going to leave the last impact behind and we'll do updates anytime we have any more information. We'll have another podcast and have Leo back on to discuss these things. So when we go back into your old stopping grounds, we're going to talk about two packs. One, we'll start with the Junction Butte pack, which occupies, I guess, sort of the north, again, the northeastern part of the park in Yellowstone, roughly, as I'm looking at the map that you gave me. So what are some of the characteristics of the Junction Butte pack that you can give everybody out there that they that would be cool to see if they go to Yellowstone? This pack is an amazing pack, I'll tell you. They are the most viewed pack in Yellowstone National Park. So you're talking about thousands and thousands of visitors coming to see this pack every year and how that burst boosts the ecotourism economy and the gateway communities around Yellowstone is amazing. So the visibility of this one pack has, you know, on, on human terms, economically, an amazing impact that's just an incredible, incredible benefit to a lot of, you know, a lot of different businesses and ecotourism companies that that are, you know, designed to get people out there to see wildlife and wolves in particular. Uh, the cool thing about this pack is um, they already had 17 members in the pack before the pups were born this April. This April, four breeding females produced a total of 18 pups. So we had 35 members. That is a huge, huge wolf pack. Uh, right now, we're getting a regular count of about 17 pups, uh, you know, four months later here in August. And so we're, we're at about, we think about 34 wolves. To put that in kind of historical perspective, um, the largest known wolf pack in the history of the world, as far as we know it, confirmed wolf pack is 37 wolves and that was the druid peak pack back in yellowstone same same area in yellowstone back in 2001 they were called a super pack and this pack is definitely you know rising to uh to kind of rising to the challenge of that number which is pretty incredible so when you because i read I, I read i think in a couple of articles or, or you might have even told me this when a pack gets to be that large numbers wise 
sometimes those packs don't last because it's such a huge number. I mean, think about having, I guess, you know, a gathering of that many people and trying to corral all those different personalities. And let's say you're having a party and you're trying to make sure everybody's happy. It's sort of the same sort of a fam- familial structure with 34 different wolf personalities in a pack and trying to coexist. Is there any sort of read that you guys get that this pack will be different than the previous largest pack and that in the way that they behave? Well, that super pack, that Druid Peak pack, I will tell you, because of the sheer numbers of mouths they had to feed, they dispersed into about four different wolf packs, counting the Druid pack. So three different packs kind of broke off of the Druid Peak pack uh, because of the sheer numbers. This pack is going to eventually have to deal with that problem as well. One of the things they have going for them uh, is that they are expert bison hunters. They are the foremost bison hunters in Yellowstone National Park. Uh, uh, you could argue that a majority of their, well, up until this, the arrival of this pack, a majority of a wolf's diet is, has been elk in Yellowstone, up to 85%. That, that is changing with this Junction Butte pack. Their reliance on bison as a main food source is very unique and actually was planned in the beginning by the individuals who uh, were part of bringing wolves to Yellowstone back in 1995, 25 years ago in the first place. They actually, back with then when they brought uh, particular wolves down from Canada, they picked wolves that hunted bison up in Canada in the hopes that they would hunt bison in Yellowstone that exist in Yellowstone in very good numbers. Um, uh, there have been a couple packs that do that, and this Junction Pack, Junction Butte Pack, it, the the pack that used to be the best bison hunting pack was the Molly's Pack. Um, they lived in a bison rich area, but then they would always come north in the winter because, uh, in the early winter, uh, because it's too hard to hunt bison. But this Junction Butte Pack, they've got some very, very good bison hunters, and they've been learning year after year after year. So bison has become uh, a main food staple for the Junction Butte Pack, and this time of year is the time of plenty for the wolves in particular, those wolves in particular. Just to put that in perspective, a bison, I believe a bison is roughly 2,000 2,500 pounds. Am I am I off in that weight range? And an elk is is an elk can be anywhere between five to seven seven hundred and fifty pounds. Am I right in that weight range? You are right. Yeah, you are there. Um, a adult male bison can be as big as two thousand pounds, and an adult male elk can be as big as seven fifty to eight hundred pounds. Yeah. So how? What do? You, so when you when you see this, what do you? What do you guys contribute to the fact that these this specific pack has become so adept and so well knowledge or so well trained, I guess, to go after an animal that is, I mean, it's roughly twenty, almost twenty times their size, and be able to take down. Obviously, I, I assume they're going after the the younger and the sicker and the weaker, as we discussed a few, you know, a couple of minutes ago. But still, you're talking about an animal, even in its infancy or a juvenile state, that is roughly the size of an adult elk that now they're going after too. What have you guys seen behaviorally that has made them so good at hunting bison? Yeah, that's a great. So like you were saying, they definitely go after the younger bison and the uh, injured bison. The reason I mentioned that this time of year is really uh, a time of plenty for the wolves is there's a there's a annual phenomenon that happens in Lamar Valley, that kind of northeastern region we're talking about, the heart of this wolf pack's territory, um, and that is called the bison rut. And the bison rut is this scenario where thousands of bison come and actually fill Lamar Valley for this mating season, the rut that happens every year. What uh, also happens as a result of this is, um, so the way, what this looks like is unlike 
uh, elk where a bull elk will try to keep, you know, tag along a group with a group of females, try to keep those females together in the hopes of breeding as many as possible. A male bison comes down, picks a particular female and stays by her side until she comes into estrus. And that male, you know, this male will bellow a warning to any bull, other bull bison that dares to get close enough, or human or car for that matter. Um, and uh, sometimes when you have evenly matched males of quite large size, the younger males will usually back down when there's an older male. But when you get two older males that are evenly matched, they will definitely come to horn to horn. Uh, and it's pretty violent to see. There's a lot of amazing energy and uh, it's pretty intense to watch. But often what happens is one of those individuals gets mortally wounded and they will survive for a number of weeks. But by the time mid-August to September gets here, about we'll lose about 20 of those bulls. And, and when that happens, you've got a 2,000 pound carcass that's lying there. And the wolves come in and they start cleaning that up, along with grizzly bears. That's, that's also the best time to see grizzly bears and wolves kind of doing this delicate dance where they, where they share a carcass together. I, I think that's fascinating that you, know, you have two major apex predators that are able to do that dance. Uh, that, that's fascinating to me that, that, yeah, that they're able to do that. So go ahead, finish your point. I apologize. No, no problem. Um, so... What we have watched with this Junction Butte pack, first I'll say here's another reason that they're so good. The ability to hunt bison is literally in their blood. The Junction Butte pack formed in 2012 when members of a pack called the Blacktail Pack, males from the Blacktail Pack, came and joined females from the Mollies Pack, that same pack that I said historically has been the best bison hunting pack. They came together and that that genetic knowledge was passed on and passed on from parent to pup um, from that very from those very early years as they formed and they've only become more proficient in my last four years in the park i was a guide and i was lucky enough to be out every day uh, watching wolves and the main pack I would see was the Junction Butte pack and I got to see how they operated on a daily basis and it was amazing how they would move into you know move through a bison herd and the the saying that a wolf lives on its legs and on its paws and and the, by through the ground it covers was literally evidenced in in watching them work their way through herds and looking and for the weaker animals and testing those animals. There's the test that happens where the wolves are trying to determine the health of a bison. And uh, there's another technique that they use where they will try to sneak up on a bison herd. So bison are pretty smart. Um, actually, 60% of bison calves survive, which is a really, really high survival rate. And that's because they have these amazing uh, strategies for dealing with predators. One is to form this imp impenetrable wall that, uh, that uh, predators wouldn't go through. The other is they come to each other's aid. And if one bison is being attacked by wolves, often if other bison are close enough, they will come to the aid of that bison and charge and, and not hesitate to charge. I've watched wolves tossed into the air by bison horns many times. Um, so there, another way that they test the bison though is in addition to going up into individuals. So to avoid that kind of strategy that the bison have, they will try to sneak up at times and kind of rush at a group of bison with the idea of hopefully getting them to stampede, to run. And when they get them into that running state, um, that's when they're also able to determine who's less healthy in the herd like they do with elk. That's, that's awesome. I mean, that, it's just an amazing deal how that goes. Before we move into the Wapiti pack, can you give anybody who's listening a couple of, just give us a couple of the wolves, I guess, to look for. If somebody listens to this and they want to look up members of the Junction Butte pack, give, I guess, your top two or three that 
they would be able to maybe search online and be able to look at and get an idea of what the Junction Butte Pack looks like? Oh, great. I would love to. Um, my, my personal favorite wolf of the pack is Wolf 907. Uh, she's a female. She's a very large female. She weighs 125 pounds. And for a female, that's up there among some of the biggest female wolves that we've known about. Um, the, the heaviest wolf on record uh, was a male and, uh, in the Yellowstone Delta Pack in the southwest corner, uh, southeast corner of the park. Um, and he weighed 147 pounds on an empty stomach. Most of your females, on average, will weigh between uh, 80 and 100 pounds, and your males will weigh anywhere from 90 to 110, 100, 100 to 120, or the numbers that are given out, like 100 to 120 and 80 to 100 for females. Uh, so 125 pounds for a female shoot. She has been the alpha female of this pack on a number of occasions. The reason I say on a number of occasions is um, the, the status, as far as we have been able to determine, of alpha, the alpha female of this pack has changed. And right now the, the belief is that the the kind of the leading female is now this uncollared black female. We call her the UBF, the uncollared black female. Uh, but 907 is right there, and it always seems like she reemerges as kind of the leader of the pack, and she still often uh, draws most of the pack with her when she goes out on hunts. So she would be one to definitely watch for, and she will be one of the bigger wolves in the pack. The other would be a really beautiful, and she's a gray wolf, a gray-coated wolf. The alpha male of the pack, 1047, um, is uh, he's a beautiful wolf who has this chocolate coloring inside, even though he's aging now. He's five years old. 907 is seven years old, so 907 born in 2015, 1047 uh, born in two, uh, 2013 for 907, 2015 for 1047, seven and five years old. Um, the cool thing about him is he has maintained his alpha status despite having this major rear um, left leg injury for most of his alpha years with the pack. He's been the alpha male of the pack since 2017. Um, and at, at the early stages of this injury, could barely put any weight on it. But he maintained his alpha status. He was still out there during the hunts, hunting, you know, taking part in the hunts and being one of the leaders sprinting after prey. And so he's a, he's a pretty amazing wolf. And he's also... I have witnessed him on a number number of occasions being amazingly affectionate and loving to his pups, going up individually to the dens. And um, I have a video where the pups all come out to greet him and he's there. And he's done that year after year after year since he's been alpha male. So for the last three years, he's pretty cool. Another wolf I really like is the beta male of the pack, uh, 1048. He's a four-year-old, and he's, 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 so the qualities of a beta, as we sometimes talk about at the ranch, are, you know, you're, you're a, you, you exhibit leadership qualities and warrior-like qualities, and he definitely exemplifies that. He, um, uh, he often goes out among herds of bison, where we're talking about, you know, hundreds of animals and works his way through being chased along the way um, just so uh, just to kind of test and he does it with an ease and a comfort that implies that he's he's not afraid this is a thing that he does all the time and he will often lead uh, lead hunts as well so he's a pretty amazing wolf he is the wolf more than anybody else, if you're in Lamar Valley or what's called Lower Lamar Valley, Little America, and you see a family of coyotes chasing a lone wolf, which they will do, in a, in a given wolf's territory, there are anywhere from 20 to 30 coyote family territories within that one wolf territory. So wolves are often 
uh, moving, especially when they're lone wolves, moving through coyote territories and being harassed by the family. And he is harassed more by coyotes than any of the other members of the pack. One other thing I will mention is interesting about the Junction Butte pack. There, there, I could go on forever about this pack, but one more thing I'll mention is there was um, 907's sister was uh, the beta female. I say that because she recently uh, died. Um, the reason that she died is she was kicked out by the pack. Um, the pack uh, basically uh, attacked her and pushed her out of the pack, and she eventually died as a lone wolf on her own a number of weeks later. The reason that she was pushed out from the pack, and this was not an immediate decision by the pack, this is something that accrued over a number of years, is uh, she was um, witnessed uh, definitely on at least one occasion in 2019, um, uh, waiting till her sister left the scene and going in and actually killing her sister's pups. And it is suspected that she was doing this in previous years, perhaps as a way for her to gain advantage for her pups. So maybe her pups could be fed more. It was something that she had practiced. Um, this type of behavior has been witnessed a few times in wolves in the past. But what happens with that is the pack recognized that she was a detriment to the pack. And so they eventually pushed her out. That this Something is all, very unique that we were able to witness because of the visibility of this bat. That's fascinating. There's just so many. It's amazing the amount of different things that you can witness that correlate, you know, into human life about how if someone's not working well for a pack, I'm not saying, you know, you kick them out of your, your group or whatever it is. If it doesn't serve you, we sort of try to say that you know, hear a little bit if we have, you know, if someone's not a pot, someone's not influencing you in the way that's going to push you forward in a positive way or in a way that's going to make you realize your best self, it really works out. And it's really, it transfers from the wild to here in multiple ways, even with our pack. So that's just a fascinating way to look at it for the Junction Butte pack. So that's, so just to recap, so 907, 1047, and 1048. So those of you that want to go check those wolves out, you can go check them out online and you know research them and you'll be able to find them. So when we move to the Wapiti Lake Pack, so they're actually near a lake, I assume, in Yellowstone or around Yellowstone Park. So what's the difference with Wapiti Lake? Do they use the lake to their advantage? Like what are some of the characteristics with this pack as opposed to Junction Butte where they're probably in the northern part of the park? Right. Um, they're actually a little bit removed from that lake. They're in another valley called Hayden Valley, which is a little bit north of Yellowstone Lake. Very close to the lake, but a little bit north of it. Um, and Hayden Valley is very much like Lamar Valley, uh, an area rich in bison and elk, at least in the, in the non-winter months. In the winter months, it... Uh, it is a place that a lot of the elk leave um, because of the, the sheer depth of the snow in that area. So to give you an example, the north, northern part of the park where the Junction Butte Pack occupies, the average elevation there is about 6,000 feet. In the southern part of the park where this Wapiti Lake Pack is, the average elevation is close to 8,000 feet. The snow... The snows, the storm systems that work their way westward up the Snake uh, River Valley Plain into southwestern Yellowstone, this high plateau among the mountains, um, those storms dump snow in that area to the tune of 600 feet per winter an incredible amount of snowfalls. So you can, you can certainly understand why the elk would disperse and get out of that area. They're not going to be able to use their paws to get down to the grass to, uh, to even supplement you know, the, the, the fat resources that they've been building up prior to winter's arrival. So this pack occupies Hayden Valley. Um, Hayden Valley is, has the Yellowstone River flowing through the heart of it. 
So the Yellowstone River is right there in the center of this valley. It's a narrower, it's about the same as uh, widthwise as Lamar Valley. Lamar Valley has the Lamar River flowing through the center of it. Um, this pack is the, right now the second biggest pack in the park, 25 wolves. The alpha female of this pack is the oldest wolf we know of in Yellowstone. She is 10 years old, so she was born in 2010. Um, founded this pack with an equally amazing and historically legendary male called Wolf 755, who started with the Lamar Canyon pack. And if any of you have read uh, the book by Nate Blakesley, American Wolf, for example, that wolf, that book is all about the Lamar Canyon pack and a wolf called the 06 female, who was the American wolf in particular. He was her mate uh, up until she was shot and then um, engaged in this Ulyssian like epic expedition crossing hundreds and hundreds of miles across Yellowstone's 30,000 square miles, uh, bigger than the states of Delaware and Rhode Island combined. And uh, that, that adventure of his lasted for about three years until he finally met this Wapiti Alpha female, and the two of them founded the Wapiti uh, Lake Pack. He is the only known male, uh, actually only known wolf we know of, to found two different wolf packs. So the, he helped found the Lamar Canyon pack with the 06 female and his brother 754. And then he founded the Wapiti Lake pack. The cool other thing um, uh, about the, the foundation of the Wapiti Lake pack is, so this, uh, what, what we call today the Wapiti alpha female, she's a white wolf. Uh, her, she's a gray coated wolf whose coat has turned increasingly white with each passing year. And now that she's 10 years old, she is very, very white. Her mother was a white wolf and her grandmother was a white wolf. So they're gray coated wolves. So there's, a, there's obviously a, a gene being passed down from mother to daughter through these generations that represents itself in the coats of these wolves. Um, the cool thing about the foundation of this Wapiti Lake Pack is her parents were uh, the alpha male and female of the Canyon Pack. This Hayden Valley that we're talking about was the heart of the Canyon Pack's territory in 2015 when this pack was going to start. What happened is her parents actually, I'm going to use the word gifted, they gifted this portion of their territory to their daughter and his, her new mate, and they moved the main area of their ter territory over to the western side, over closer to the Old Faithful area, so that their daughter could start this wolf pack on her own, which is pretty incredible to think about. There are so many things I want to ask in there, but I, I just want to mention the fact that there's that distinction of being an alpha male for two very significant packs in Yellowstone is, is incredible in and of itself. And then, as you say, for to witness these the the these adult wolves gifting, as you say, or sort of turning over this territory to their daughter to be able to start this this pack that has now grown to twenty five wolves is incredible. What were the things that were seen? Were you were you there at that time? Were you able to see with your own eyes like how? how how this pack was able to form form itself? Were you there when when the male and female met? Was that in your time frame when you were there? It was definitely uh, 2015 when they first met. Uh, I, I as a guide. Uh, this is slightly. This is one year. No, actually, this is my first year of being a guide. Uh, we often would travel to both Lamar Valley and Hayden Valley, knowing those are the two best places, two of the best places to see wolves in the park on a regular basis. So we would try to hit Lamar Valley in the morning and maybe uh, head down to Hayden Valley later in the morning in the hopes of making it a multi-wolf pack day. Um, so we got to, we got to see this, this pack form. And in 2015, the alpha female gave birth to four pups. Um, 
what happened is um, winter came along. So the pups are, are, you know, they're growing, growing. um, And we get into the winter when the elk are departing. These two wolves, the two adults, were not very good at, you know, trying to work on the bison that were down in Hayden Valley. And so they, so what happened is that 755 led his mate northward back into old territories that he used to be his home territory um, and other areas that he'd crossed in his travels. So he was very familiar with these areas, but they did have to cross several uh, other wolf pack territories along the way and hazard, you know, hazard the, the uh, obstacles that that would create. And by the time they came back from this winter adventure, only one of the pups was with them. She actually went on to become a very famous wolf within the pack. We called her the yearling female before she was ever collared. And then when she was collared, she was known as Wolf 1091. She was a breeder and a really fun thing about being a guide or being a visitor to the park with her is she loved to bring her pups down to the riverside. And they would frolic along this on the banks of the Yellowstone River. And here we are watching this whole thing unfold. Um, and so that was pretty amazing. Then in uh, 2016, they had four more pups. Uh, the reason that they have so few pups in these years in comparison to this Junction Butte pack that had 18 pups is at the pup uh, litter size has everything to do with the availability of prey. And so that often dictates, dictates the size of a wolf pack. Uh, that's why this, this Junction Butte's, Butte Pack's prey base is, is huge. And uh, uh, so they, there's a lot of, there was a lot of room for them to grow. But four more pups were born in 2016 to the Wapiti Lake Pack. Then something that it's a way of life but it is something that a lot of people thought of as a sad event three big large males from the molly's pack came in the summer of 2016 and decided they wanted the alpha female and the daughter 1091 as as they took interest in them and would not leave their sides 755 being a lone wolf was gun was not going to be a match for those three and was not going to be able to you know take them on he was a wolf of smaller stature as well but he um these and these were larger molly's wolves he but he stayed in the area whenever the molly's wolves would go off hunting with the females he would come in and we'd see this amazing moment where his four pups would come rushing from all angles and rush up still recognizing him and knowing who he was and and greeting him and the five of them frolicking around for these moments, these tearful moments that we were all witnessing. Um, And he tried and tried to wait out these three males, but they did not leave. And so in the end, he dispersed once again. His, uh, he was actually born in 2008 outside of the park, West it kind of West central, an area west of West Yellowstone itself to this uh, unnamed pack. Um, and he and his brother traveled from that location two years after they were born in 2010, all the way to northern part of the park to hook up with this 06 female and start the Lamar Canyon pack. So he was, he was going back toward an, his old natal territory, basically, and then continued his adventure for years. Um, and the kind of the pack went on from there. These, I could listen to you tell stories all day about, about the, because it's such, it, it, it feels human in that way because it's such a, it's a story of a family that's growing and finding their way. And it's, it's just so beautiful to hear how these, these packs have survived, they've evolved, they've moved, and they figured out a way to make themselves relevant in this, in this Yellowstone ideal scenario. And I, I find that so incredibly fascinating. I keep using that word. I can't really figure out anything else to say other than that. And it's such a beautiful way that you tell it that the, these packs have still continued to evolve and coexist 
in this area. So if we were to if we were to say for the Wapiti Lake Pack, just if you could give us the update, I guess you were saying that this is a twenty five uh, wolf pack, twenty five in number. Just give us the give us the give us where they are right now. If you know if the what their breeding was for this for this past season, and then just a wolf or two that if people were going to look up or they were going to head to Yellowstone, that they would be able to uh, zero in on for this for this pack. So just what they where they stand right now, and then just a wolf or two that would be ones to look out for. All right. So, yeah. So, this pack of 25 is uh, comprised of 10 adults, nine yearlings, and six pups. Um, the breakdown of the pups, well, the age variance is uh, 10 for the alpha female, 7 for the alpha male, 10, 14. So, this alpha female, she's going to stand out if you see her. She's... She's as white as a polar bear, and she's definitely one to watch for. She's a very charismatic wolf. Like I said, the oldest wolf in the park. Her alpha mate is wolf 1014, one of those three Molly's males that originally came in 2016. He's a very large black wolf who is green with age. He's seven years old. And you've got some really nice generational representation with this pack. Four years old, three years old, two years old. Uh, then the yearlings, and then, of course, the four-month-old pups that are part of the pack as well. That's awesome. So we have, so both the Junction Butte and the, Wapiti, and the Wapiti Lake, just like the Lassen Pack, have that multi-generational status that you, that you as, a, as, as a former guide and tracker and your colleagues that are still there are looking at, again, as a successful pack that continues to grow and continues to flourish in the park, correct? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. This is phenomenal. Leo, thank you so much for coming on. We're going to touch on other packs. If you have any other updates that come from, the, we're going to keep our eyes on the Lassen pack. And if you have any other updates from any other packs in Yellowstone, I want to have you back on again so we can touch on some other ones because there's so much information and you're just, you're a wealth of knowledge and the stories that you tell are phenomenal. Just uh, again, give me your your Instagram again. Is L Lecky? Is that correct? Is that what your Instagram is? Yeah, it is. Yep, L Lecky, okay. and then Facebook is Leo Lecky. And I just wrote a story about seven fifty five on my Facebook page that you can read as well. Yeah, guys, definitely check out his definitely check out his Facebook page. Leo is a master storyteller when it comes to these wolves. He has the 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 family tree books that he writes and the 25th anniversary book right that you also co-authored correct with two of your colleagues am i right on that yeah yep you're right 20 uh charting it's called charting yellowstone wolves 25th anniversary edition yeah and then uh if you want to become a guest of the family tree where it is the largest tree uh, largest family tree on Ancestry.com with over 700 guests and uh, we're approaching 1,300 wolves now. Um, go to our website, our web portal called wolfgenes.info. That's W-O-L-F, genes as in DNA, G-E-N-E-S. So wolfgenes.info. From there, go to the Ancestry tab, scroll down to the invitation section and just follow the instructions to request uh, access to the tree. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I, I became a member after we had a, had a discussion here, I think a few weeks ago. So definitely go, guys, definitely go check that out. If you're interested, check out Leo's page for all that information. Check out his Instagram. Again, wealth of knowledge. Leo, it's always great to have you on the podcast. You're welcome anytime. Obviously, keep me updated. I hope you guys are doing well down there. Hopefully, I'll see you in person soon. Uh, we miss you up here. <laughs> um, and hopefully, things will get better. But thank you once again. You're always welcome back. Thank you, Leo Lecky, for being on the podcast once again. Thank you, John. And I'm looking forward to that time where we get to see each other again in person too. Absolutely. We'll do one of these podcasts in person. 
at some point. Um, Howls to all of you out there, and we will talk to you all next time. Bye, everybody. Bye.